Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's program. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series brought to you by the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality. It's good to be with you all once again for another lunchtime lecture. We gather here at the museum's YouTube channel every Wednesday at noon to meet interesting people who are doing interesting, fascinating work in the world of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, nature conservation, education, all of the above. There are great people all across the state of North Carolina who are working outside and inside in order to bring us a great nature-based educational step. Today is no different. Uh, this is a great season if you like to be outdoors and, and you can find a day when it's not getting too hot to go outside and look for bugs. And uh, if you've been tuning into the program, at least when with me, I always love when we have folks on the show who talk about native pollinators because I've got a small pollinator garden out here in my yard, which working from home is great because I can look out the window and I can see all of these great plants and I can look for great uh, bugs and butterflies and birds that are coming to visit. But my space is small and doesn't get visited by too many critters. So I think today's gonna be especially exciting to learn about one of the most as I hear and understand it, superb pollinator gardens in, I'll just say, all of central North Carolina. I don't know if that's true, but we're going to learn about it today. Today's guest is Debbie Roos. Debbie, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. Glad to be so here. I so have, I have here that you're the agricultural extension agent for the Chatham County Center of the North Carolina Cooperative uh, Extension. What does that mean your job is? So primarily, we are basically county faculty for the land grant university at NC State. And primarily, I work with farmers uh, selling commercial vegetable, doing commercial vegetable production, organic production. I also work with beekeepers and forest landowners. OK, fascinating. But today, we're going to learn about native pollinator gardening. Is this right? That's right. I got into the pollinator work with my through my work with beekeepers who needed help with uh, honey plants for bees, and I wanted to develop resources for them. And it quickly expanded um, not just honey plants for honeybees, of course, which are not native, but looking at plants that support all of our pollinators, including our 560 species of native bees and all the other critters that are out there. Sounds fascinating. I'm excited to learn more. Uh, I'll let you take it away. All right. Thank you, Chris. Let me share my screen. And we do have a little bit of a lag here, we've learned. So uh, we'll just have to bear with me as it takes a little time to get things going here. Which I'll remind everybody, too, uh, this presentation is interactive in that whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, Drop your questions and comments into the chat box or into the comments thread. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll be going there to get your questions and ask Debbie. So as we go through, leave your thoughts there for the Q&A at the end. Thanks. And Chris, if you'll just let me know when you see my title slide. I will. I'm, I'm waiting on it to pop up. It worked in rehearsal, everybody, so I know it's going to work here. And of course, in the meantime, folks, let me know where you're watching the program from. If you're in North Carolina, outside of North Carolina, we always like to know where people hear about the show and where you're tuning in from. Okay, there's the title slide. It looks like we're ready to go. Okay, and Chris, just just kind of give me some feedback if, if I'm not if I'm not managing the time lag here well, if you don't mind. It's a little more of a lag than I'm used to. So today, what I want to talk about in my allotted time is I'm going to share with you my top 25 native pollinator plants, and then I'm going to uh, walk you through a virtual tour of the pollinator paradise garden through the seasons, and then I'm going to leave you with some of the resources I've developed on my website. 
And first of all, just a little bit of background about the Pollinator Paradise Garden. Um, this is a cooperative extension project. I developed it as a demonstration garden uh, back in 2008, really before anyone was using the term pollinator garden. Um, and the idea was to have a teaching garden uh, where I develop habitat and showcase um, a lot of our native plants. Also, learn where people could learn about pollinators. And because we use only organic techniques, it was a great way to teach about organic gardening, and and, and again also uh, you know the value of native plants. The garden has grown over time. So I started it in 2008, but uh, over the years I've added to it, and it now has over 225 unique species, and 85% of them are native to North Carolina. So it's right in Pittsboro. Uh, if any of y'all have ever been to little old Pittsboro, the county seat of Chatham County, um, just west of the museum in Raleigh. And um, it's open 24 seven to the public because it's, it's on um, you know, public space. And I do have the help of a small group of volunteers who help me manage it. I definitely could not do it by myself. So I'm very appreciative to have them. Now, um, so again, I'm gonna kind of share with you some of my top 25 native pollinator plants. And uh, these are based on my experience in the pollinator garden. And I'm gonna, uh, you may ask, well, how did I come up with top 25? Well, when I talk to you about the website later, you'll see where I have a list of all the plants in the garden. And it's, it's very overwhelming. It's like a 10 page list of these you know, 225 species plus cultivars. And I know that can be a little overwhelming for people. So I thought, well, I'm gonna develop a shorter list um, that's just really um, highlights my favorite plants. And these are uh, based on a, a, some criteria that I developed. Uh, first of all, I did wanna focus on native plants um, because research has proven that in general, native plants provide many more benefits to wildlife. Uh, obviously, I'm going to have, have on the list, you know, plants that are uh, highly attractive, not just to humans, aesthetically, but also to pollinators, because not all plants are created equal in, um, you know, in their attractiveness to pollinators. And um, these are plants that I've had in the garden for many years, so they're, they're tested. I've been observing them for, you know, 13, 14 years and caring for them and learning about them, and, and I know their needs. They're also going to be what I call workhorse plants, which means they, um, they're they not just valuable that short time when they're in bloom, you know, two to four weeks. They're going to offer benefits and, and value uh, at least three seasons out of the year and sometimes four. And then finally, I, I, I'm only really putting plants on the list that I think you'll be able to find in local nurseries. I have a lot more than 25 favorite plants, I, trust me. Um, some of them I almost hesitate to, to talk to people about because I know they're going to have a hard time finding them in nursery. So, um, and I may show you a few of those. And, and we have a few new native plant nurseries coming on that are growing some of these. So that's the good news. Um, so I thought I would also start out, I do whole talks just on this, but I'm just kind of giving y'all a very brief overview of some general guidelines when you're planting for pollinators. The idea here is to have plants blooming from early spring to late fall. So you really want that long succession of blooms uh, for all the pollinators that, that need it, you know, through that time period. Again, as I mentioned already, I like to encourage people to emphasize native plants. I'm not saying you should only plant native plants, but they do provide more value to wildlife. And again, that's another whole talk in itself. Um, it's really important to include a diversity of plants. So I'm talking about, you know, plants that have blooms of different colors and shapes and sizes, because that helps attract pollinators with different tongue lengths and different foraging uh, habits, et cetera. And it's good to have plants that offer benefits throughout the year, as I mentioned earlier, those workhorse plants. And then when I find a plant that is highly attractive to pollinators, you know, on a scale compared as relative to others, I'll usually try to plant more than one species of that. So that would include things like uh, milkweed or goldenrod and aster. Um, in my garden, I have 12 species of native aster 
and also 12 different species of native goldenrod. So that means my goldenrod starts blooming in July and goes all the way through October um, because I've got different species. Of course, you'll wanna include host plants for butterflies, you know, when you're uh, planting for pollinators. So that's always fun to, you know, intentionally plant things so that you'll have caterpillars eating it. And then, you know, educating people about that because a lot of people wanna know, well, how do I kill the caterpillars that are eating my plants? And then it's really important to uh, offer native grasses. That may not be your first thought when thinking about pollinators because you're thinking about flowers. Well, first of all, native grasses do bloom, but they, and some of them are host plants for butterflies, but they, more importantly, they provide really important structure for the garden, especially in the winter months and, and also valuable uh, shelter and even nesting sites for uh, wildlife and some of our native bees. So I'm gonna start out, uh, we're gonna go through the seasons and sharing the top 25 list. And by the way, this list is downloadable on my website. So I'll make sure y'all know how to find that, uh, you know, before we leave here today. So some of my favorite spring blooming um, uh, native pollinator plants, we're gonna look at those. So I'm gonna go through all the 25, actually plus one bonus one. And then I'm going to show you the virtual tour. You'll see many of these 25 plants in, in context or mixed with other things as well. So this is kind of a quick overview of each species first, and then you'll see it in the garden. So spiderwort, I have a couple of different species of that. Um, it's primarily a spring bloomer, but it'll often rebloom in the fall. This is a good plant if you have part shade, but it will tolerate full sun. Um, it, it usually goes completely dormant in the summer, uh, and then again, it'll rebloom a little bit in the fall. Now, this is one that will seed in <laughs> pretty readily, um, so just, just be prepared for that, um, and you can always dig them up and give them to your friends if you don't want that to happen, but uh, Tratoscantia or spiderwort, highly attracted to honeybees and bumblebees especially, and, and also some of our leaf cutter bees. And um, here it is, I hope you, I know y'all may not be seeing this slide yet, um, but here's a, a bigger, okay, good, thanks, Chris. A bigger picture of it uh, mixed, you know, with uh, viburnum. And it looks kind of like a grass, um, but it's got these beautiful flowers. And depending on the cultivar, or even actually within the same plant, you'll see quite a bit of variation in color. So the next one I'd like to talk about is Blue Star, Amsonia Tabernae, Montana. I have two Amsonia species in the garden. The other one is Amsonia hubrichtii, which is the Arkansas blue star. And it's, you know, if you can tell by the name, but not native to North Carolina. It's got a thinner leaf than the, the native, the North Carolina native, but they're both beautiful. I encourage you to have both. Uh, this is a, such an awesome plant. It's very floriferous. It has just um, um, so many of these beautiful star shaped sky blue blooms in the spring. And this is a, a plant that really has the, uh, I would argue four seasons of interest because when it's done blooming, uh, it's got beautiful foliage. Uh, the, the, the Arkansas native has a real airy feathery foliage, a little, you know, a lighter texture than this one. Um, and then the other neat thing is it in the fall, it turns um, golden yellow. So it basically gives you another show in the fall. And then in the winter, it has nice decorative seed pods. So. Uh, I'll, you'll be seeing more pictures of it um, in the other slides, but here's a close up of the blooms, just really beautiful bloom and um, it attracts lots of different bees. Uh, this is a leaf cutter bee, but you'll also see lots of uh, bumblebees. Um, let's see, uh, I'm trying to think what else, honeybees, and also quite a few species of butterflies on Blue Star. It's just a beautiful plant, something you'll definitely want in your garden. Okay, if somebody had a gun to my head and I had to name my top 10 plants, this one would be on it. Um, wild indigo or, or Baptisia species is amazing. This is a three seasons of interest plant. Uh, I have several uh, species in the garden, so unique species as well as different cultivars. Um, and it has amazing blooms in the spring. Uh, the primary pollinators or bees that you'll see on this are, are really the only bees are bumblebees and leaf cutter bees. It's a really important early uh, pollen nectar source for these bees, um, especially the bumblebees as they're forming their colonies. 
Um, the primary colors, uh, depending on the species, and again, the cultivars or cultivated varieties are blue, white, yellow, and purple. Um, this does prefer full sun. Um, and the fall interest in this one is the seed pods. The one thing I would tell you about, about this is it has no winter presence. Highly unusual. It cuts its, its what I call self upsizing. I think I made that term up, <laughs> but what it means is it cuts itself off at the soil line in the fall and it becomes a tumbleweed. So you will, if you, I would not uh, suggest planting like three of them together because in the winter you're going to have a huge open gap in your garden with nothing there. So just spread them out in your garden. But here's a close up of the white one, Baptisia alba, just stunning. Um, especially when those little anthers poke out with the, the yellow pollen on them. Baptisia alba sometimes blooms later than the others, which is really nice. And here's a close up of the American bumblebee uh, foraging on uh, Carolina moonlight is the name of this cultivar. Um, and they just get right up in there in the bloom. And here are the seed pods. They're, they're already formed and you'll see them now in the garden and they're beautiful, but in the fall when they dry out and the wind blows, it sounds like a, a rattle, which is a really pleasant sound and reminds you to use all your senses in the garden. I'm always dragging people over to the plants to listen, you know, to the, to the rattle when the wind blows. It's just really nice. And I'll show you a lot more pictures later of Baptisia. Another great plant for the spring is beard tongue or pinstemon species. Um, these are spring bloomers uh, only, um, and they, uh, the two species I have are kind of lavender, purple, and white. This is Pinstemon smallii right here, or small beard tongue. Sometimes they rebloom a little bit in the fall, um, and, and this is the other species I have, um, Pinstemon digitalis, or foxglove beard tongue, and you can see in this picture, uh, on the, uh, uh, you got a little sweat bee up top, and then a nice chunky bumblebee, both foraging on those beautiful white flowers, and they'll be very active uh, in the spring. Now, another nice spring bloomer is the golden Alexander, Zizia aurea. Um, I have another species of Zizia, Zizia aptera, which is the heart leaf, but um, this is uh, primarily a spring bloomer, will sometimes rebloom a little bit in the fall, um, and it gets about two to three feet. Um, it can handle some part shade, the other neat thing about this, besides these beautiful blooms, which attract, this is a mining bee. You'll see lots of honeybees on these and wasps and whatnot. Um, but um, the other neat thing about it is it's the native host plant for our black swallowtail butterfly. That's the caterpillar you typically see on our garden plants like you know dill and parsley and fennel. So it's nice to have a native plant host for them as well. Now it can seed in a little bit, and I will warn you, it does have a tap root. So it's something you have to dig out if it seeds in. You can't just pluck it out of the ground like you would a lot of the other ones. Uh, here's a, a, a beautiful paper wasp uh, enjoying the blooms of um, uh, Golden Alexander. It also looks really nice in the summer when it's done blooming. Okay, oh, and here's the black swallowtail munching, munching, munching on the leaves, uh, enjoying, enjoying the leaves of that. Okay, and then of course we have the, the one I'm sure most of y'all are familiar with, the purple cone flowers. And I have it listed as a spring bloomer, but actually it will bloom on into the fall. Um, many, I have a, few, a couple of species, but even more than that, different cultivars. Um, and this can handle full sun to part shade. It'll attract a lot of different pollinators. And of course, the seed for that is a really important uh, bird food source. So I love seeing the goldfinches and other birds enjoying the seeds on these. But you'll see, you know, lots of butterflies and hummingbird moths and, and, and different species of bees enjoying the coneflower. So those are always uh, mandatory as far as I'm concerned for any North Carolina garden. Another great flower is the blanket flower, the gallardias. Now these will bring bloom from spring to fall if you keep them deadheaded. And there's different colors, um, you know, the yellows to burgundies. Uh, this is a great plant, extremely drought tolerant. You'll even see these at the coast, uh, but they'll attract, you know, many different bees and butterfly species. This is a, a red banded hair streak here. 
Another one that's in peak bloom right now is the Stokes Aster. It's as an evergreen, Stokesia lavis. Um, and actually in this case, I, there's a particular cultivar that I recommend and prefer. It's called Peachy's Pick. And that's what this is. And we can have a whole conversation about straight species versus cultivars. And, you know, some conventional wisdom was that for pollinators, it's better to go with a straight species because we don't know if the, the named cultivar is providing benefits to pollinators. But research has shown that it really depends on the cultivar. There's a phlox cultivar called Gina that has been shown to be more attractive to butterflies than the straight species. So it really depends. I handle that by having both. Uh, I'm not gonna, you know, um, deprive myself of these beautiful coneflower varieties, but I make sure I also have the straight species. And, and I don't, I, I think that's a pretty good solution if I may say so. But um, this is a nice one. And again, sometimes you'll see some, um, a little bit of a rebloom in the fall. Here's a leaf cutter bee enjoying the Stokes Aster. These look really nice combined with uh, coneflowers and uh, mountain mint and things like that. So now we're moving on to the bee balm. I bet y'all are familiar with that one as well. The Monardas, I have several species of this. It can be, you know, it can spread, but it's fairly easy to pull out. Uh, in this case, I like this cultivar Claire Grace because Monardas can be uh, prone to powdery mildew. So this is a, a species or a cultivar, excuse me, that seems to be quite resistant to powdery mildew. So I really like it um, and, and recommend that. Uh, one of the, my favorite shrubs is a late spring, early summer blooming shrub, New Jersey tea or Ceanothus americanus. Um, and it gets to be about three to four feet high, about the same width. Um, and, and it's really beloved by the bumblebees and beetles and, and, and honeybees and all kinds of things. So here's a close up showing the blooms of that. That one just finished blooming. We've got a few stray blooms on that one showing up. All right, so now we're moving into the summer blooming plants. Checking the time here. Okay. Um, so, oh, I love this one. This would be on a top 10 list too, if I had to do one. So a uh, blazing star, sometimes called gay feather. Um, I have several species of this, this particular one, uh, Liatris spicata. Uh, this is a, can be quite a tall plant, four to five feet or more, but the thing is it's got a very narrow profile. So it's what we call a seafood plant. So that means you can even plant it at the front of a bed if you want, because you can see right past it. Um, but again, this is this will be full. I just love it because it blooms all along the stem. But each species, you know, has a little bit of a different uh, bloom placement. You'll see lots of pictures throughout this uh, later on. Uh, mountain mints. We've got about I think twelve native species of pycnanthemum in North Carolina. I think I have six or eight of them in the garden. I, I'm losing track. Uh, again, would make a top ten list if I had to do one. Um, you know, they can be kind of, some of them have quite inconspicuous blooms, but they're still beautiful plants. And this is one of those um, genus that attract a tremendous diversity of pollinators. And that's not true for all these plants. If you'll recall for the Baptisia, as I said, you're really only going to see bumblebees and leafcutter bees on it. But mountain mint and Joe Pa weed and those kind of plants, you're going to see pretty much every insect order, it seems, you know, on it at the same time. So it's really valuable for that and very long blooming. Here's a, a buckeye butterfly on one of the uh, Virginia mountain mints. See the little tiny white blooms, but they the pollinators love that. <laughs> they get right. It's not the showiest plant, although some of the species like uh, Muticum have these kind of silvery bracts that were quite beautiful. Okay, and then of course the milkweeds. Um, you definitely want to include uh, our native milkweeds in your garden. I have ten species of native milkweed in, in the garden. Uh, each one occupies a different niche. Uh, some like moist soil, some like it really hot and dry like this butterfly weed here. And of course, uh, of course you want these because they are a host plant for the monarch caterpillars, but they also are really favored by uh, lots of different uh, bees and also butterflies. So here's just an example of some of the uh, native milkweeds I have. Um, uh, the world milkweed, Asclepias verticillata, has got a very narrow leaf, very small flower, but you'll still see monarchs on it. It's really amazing the diversity. We were just looking at that this morning. 
I mean, the, the leaf of world milkweed, let me think. I mean, it's got, the width of the lip, uh, leaf is like a grain of rice. Um, compared that to the really broad leaf uh, of a of common milkweed or something. Um, but anyway, you see the diversity there. Some like part shade, like red ring milkweed and poke milkweed. So if you have a little part shade area, that's where you'd want to put those. So again, just having different types is, is helpful. This is a very underutilized plant, in my opinion, the Culver's root or Veronicaster virginicum. It's just going, it's just starting to bloom and will be in peak bloom in another couple of weeks. Um, it's just beautiful. It's got this candelabra-like flower and world leaves. Uh, it stays upright usually, pretty good at that. It, it loves moist soil if you have it. Um, I don't, and <laughs> it does really well, but just really gorgeous flowers. And you'll see a lot of diversity of, of bees and butterflies and it blooms for a couple of months. Uh, bone sed is a, a, a relative of Joe Pa weed. Uh, again, long blooming, stays upright. If you have moist soil, that's great. Um, and, 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 and I just love that it has the long, the long blooming period and really unique uh, white flowers. Uh, great blue labelia, uh, you're probably more familiar with the, the cousin, the, uh, the cardinal flower, the red cardinal flower. So this one can tolerate uh, drier soil and full sun. Uh, cardinal flower prefers, you know, part shade at least and a little wetter soil, but this is a beautiful plant um, to have in the garden. And this is a really cool one too, the rattlesnake master, Oryngium yuccifolium. I really like weird flowers, you know, not your typical petals and, you know, disc flowers, ray flowers. Uh, so this has no petals or ray flowers. It's this prickly white ball, <laughs> which I think is really cool. And similar to the mountain mints and the Joe Pa weed, it just attracts a tremendous diversity of insects. Um, so it's in peak bloom right now and you, everything flocks to it, you know, at all at the same time. It's like they all share space, you know, on the same bloom. So it's really fun. It's a very architectural plant as well. And you'll, we'll see more pictures. Another great shrub to have is, in the garden is St. John's wort or Hypericum frondosum. There are other species as well. Um, it's just got these beautiful, cheerful yellow blooms uh, in the summer. And it's especially loved by honeybees and bumblebees. This is one of our medicinal plants. And uh, I will say that the bees, when they're foraging on it, they act kind of buzzed. <laughs> so they're look quite kind of kind of frantic, you know, uh, going over the blooms. But isn't that a weird, isn't that a, just a cool bloom? I just love it. And you can see the full pollen baskets on those honeybees there. Okay, this, I snuck this one in. Uh, this is a bonus plant. It's not on my top 25, but I just had to sneak it in because I love it so much. Even though a lot of people just think it's too weedy, um, look at that bloom. I mean, how could you not fall in love with that? So this is our native purple passion flower. And I'm gonna emphasize native <laughs> because a lot of the nurseries carry the non-native one. And if you buy that one, you'll be very sorry. Um, Make sure you're not getting the South American native, you know, like Passiflora cerulea. It will take over your garden like kudzu. So please make sure you're getting Passiflora incarnata. It's deciduous. It dies back. It's still, I will warn you, very weedy. It will pop up everywhere. So I, I, I did warn you about that. Don't tell me I didn't. But the good news is, is it's really easy to pull out, okay? So it'll, it'll just seed in. It'll ramble over shrubs. And, and a lot of times all, all or other plants and um, all you got to do is if it's being a little too, you know, boisterous, you just pull it out. And I always do a caterpillar check if I'm going to, you know, do that because it could have a variegated fritillary caterpillar on it. It's also medicinal. So when I do want to um, thin it out, I, I bring along my herbalist friend who collects them and makes tinctures out of them. But this is a great plant. Not only is it great for pollinators, it's, as I mentioned, medicinal, it's also edible. It produces an edible fruit. Um, but it's, it's just, it, you know, and as I mentioned, it's a host plant for the variegated fritillary. You can put it on a trellis or just let it ramble. Uh, primarily, you're gonna see carpenter bees. And as we see here, and they seem to be holding hands there, <laughs> holding legs there, and honeybees. Now, this, this flower was perfectly designed for the carpenter bee. If you ever see a carpenter bee that has a yellow thorax, like you see here, then you know you have passion flower vines in your area. 
because they are perfectly sized that when they're sipping nectar at the base of their corona there, they're scraping their thorax under the anthers. When the honeybees visit this flower, they're way too small. They're not getting uh, pollen on their thorax. So it's kind of a neat little sign that you may not know you have passion flower in your yard, but you do if you see this. But um, just a beautiful flower. Okay, another favorite shrub of mine is the button bush. Now this is known as a wetland plant, but it's, it's perfectly dry soil in my area. So it does really well. It attracts a lot of diversity. Again, that kind of spiky bloom. Uh, we've got a bumblebee enjoying this one. And um, so I really like the diversity of insects that that attracts. Uh -oh, my PowerPoint's frozen, hang on. I think we just skipped the slide. Let me go back. Okay. I'm getting a little loud. Yeah, we're looking at a, a close up of a, a ball, flower ball. Yeah, uh, we skipped over one. It's okay. This is just a neat macro shot of the florets before they open. I just included it because I thought they looked like little mummies. <laughs> but that is a super cool flower. You know, you can see the little black spots. Those are the eyes. <laughs> Not really, but. Um, okay, so we'll see more Joe Pye, I mean more button bush. Um, Joe Pye weed, I love it. Um, just be careful in selecting the species because they can get quite tall, you know, like 10 feet or more. Uh, I have um, this species, actually, I'm sorry, I need to correct that. Eutrochium dubium is the, is the more recent name. Uh, again, one of those that attracts a lot of diversity, like this bumblebee here, and it's just about to start blooming in the pollinator garden. Here's a monarch enjoying the blooms, but you'll see lots of different predators on it. Um, you know, like assassin bugs love to hang out there and, and green link spiders to see what they can catch. You know, all the different, they know that it's a pollinator magnet. So we're gonna move into the fall blooming plants now. Um, I'm trying to pause here in case we're seeing, I don't know what y'all are seeing. Of course, you'll wanna include the asters. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, I've got about 12 species of native aster, each one, uh, so this is an example of having that diversity of blooms. So some of them have a, a mounding, you know, beach ball like shape. Others have a very loose canopy. I'm talking about just asters here. Some of them only bloom along the stem, some like part shade. So this is Eastern silvery aster and it's very unique. It just blooms along the stem um, and it, you know, and just looks completely different than the aromatic aster that we saw earlier. Here's the frost aster, also completely different, a little pea-sized white bloom in the fall, very much a pollinator magnet. That's where all the action's happening uh, in the fall. Now the golden rods, again, a lot of diversity there, um, you know, and so di and having different species will help lengthen uh, your bloom season there. Here's just a few examples of the different types of golden rods I have in the garden. Um, you know, some are like a wand, and uh, of course, everybody loves the fireworks goldenrod. It looks like you know, the zigzag blooms. So lots of diversity there. You can pick the ones that you like and lengthen that bloom season. We have a few different species of ironweed. Uh, typically, the New York ironweed um, is, is quite tall, but I have some that aren't as tall. This is the cutleaf ironweed. Um, it's about three feet high. Uh, here's a sunflower bee enjoying the bloom of a stemless ironweed. It's a beautiful, I call this my velvet Elvis, because <laughs> that's what that bee reminds me of. I don't know why. But notice all the hairy, the scopa, the, the branched hairs on the legs of that, that sunflower bee to enable it to very, very efficiently carry pollen. Okay, horsemint uh, is a nice fall bloomer, Monarda punctata. It attracts a lot of different pollinators. You got a little honeybee tucked up in the bloom there. And then climbing aster is a woody vine that's going to bloom late in the season. And the neat thing about this is I love it so much and I wanted more of it and I didn't really want to have to put up more trellis. So I experimentally planted it as a shrub to see how it would do. Like what would happen if I pruned this very vigorous woody vine as a shrub? Would it do well? And it does. This is actually the top uh, overtopping a trellis here. Um, this is my, my climbing aster vine shrub. <laughs> it's very happy and I just keep it pruned in that shape and it has, and it, so it's really wonderful and it's much later bloomer than the other asters. All right, so now I'm watching my time, Chris. I'm going to give you all a, um, a, a kind of a quick virtual tour uh, through the seasons of the garden. Um, 
so that we can see what, you know, just kind of different angles of the garden. So in the spring, you're going to see, you know, your, your, your bap Baptisia system with the golden Alexander. Oh, I just love that white Baptisia. I just think that's beautiful with some um, Rebecca in the background. Um, some of the bee balm, the monardas with the tick seed and the cone flowers. Um, this is a, uh, hopefully you're seeing what I'm seeing. The Piedmont Barber's Buttons, this very delicate uh, white blooming uh, spring bloomer. Oh, it's just so pretty. Uh, and then of course our native columbines in the garden will attract your hummingbirds and also bees. Um, here's a, um, a monarch caterpillar on the purple milkweed. So pretty much every year we start seeing the first monarch butterflies right around tax day, April 15th. And then I start looking for the eggs and then I start looking for the little caterpillars that hatch. So um, here's, our, I love seeing all our little friends and buddies and critters in the garden. This is the Carolina anol and the uh, yarrow. Um, one of the beds, this is our native uh, Adam's needle or yucca in full bloom um, with those uh, moth pollinated white blooms. Ooh, this is a neat plant called goat's root, tephrosia. It's a bicolor bloom, um, just, just love it. And the bumblebees also love it and the leaf cutter bees, really unusual plant. I just took this picture like two days ago. So this is uh, one of the beds and showing the blazing star and the cone flowers and the culver's root. This is another recent pick with the, um, you know, cone the orange cone flowers and phlox and whatnot. So the thing about this garden, you got to understand a lot of it's in a parking lot. <laughs> it is a tough site. Uh, there's some beds that are bordered by lawn. There's some beds that are completely surrounded by parking lots. So it's, it's, if you can, if I can grow it there, you can grow it. This is a really cool shrub called dwarf indigo bush that's just finishing up its bloom. Just incredible flowers. Another recent shot, it's a Chatham Mills complex spring. Uh, wild quinine, got a really unusual white flower with that butterfly weed in the background. Everyone wants to always know what this plant is. This is a native non-binding clematis, but it's called curly heads and you can see why. So that is the seed head. It blooms earlier and then it forms this really interesting seed. It still looks like this now. Uh, another spring shot with the um, Baptisia and the yarrow and the golden Alexander. Um, more uh, purple milkweed and coreopsis. This is a zebra longhorn beetle on the uh, blue star. I love the, uh, the downy woodman. It's that blue blooming with the, the blanket flowers. Nice combination of the baptisia with the uh, blue star. And there's your bumblebees there. That's who you're going to see a lot on a lot of the Baptisias. They're going to just, just eat them up. More of that downy wood mint. This is a, one of the few plants that I mail order. It's, called, it's a Midwestern native. It's called purple prairie clover. And you can see how popular it is. It's a really cool flower. And um, lemon bee balm and cone flowers and blanket flower. There's our little friend again. So the thing is, you get these predators out there and they, they, they're eating my pollinators, but that's okay. <laughs> as long as they belong there. The one predator I don't like is the Chinese praying mantis. And I will actually remove those egg cases in the winter. I don't, I don't kill adult praying mantids, but I don't want too many of them because they're displacing our native Carolina mantids. But you see this little critter here, this little fellow's got a, one of my pollinators in his mouth. But I'm good with that because he belongs there. Uh, another one of the beds here. Um, this is a little shady corner. You get some foam flower and um, spider ward and viburnum. I'm going to speed up a little bit so we get save time for questions. We got two more seasons to go, <laughs> but I'm watching the time. This is a really beautiful flower called fire pink. The, the pink is not for the color, which is obviously not pink, but red. It's for the, uh, the kind of the, you know, the pinking shears that look like somebody took to the end of the petal there. Oh, I have a whole story about native thistle. So I had to work hard to get that in the garden because you can't find thistle in the nurseries because I think because when people think of thistle, they think of the noxious weedy thistle on the roadside, which are not native. So because I couldn't get plants, I had to buy the seed and direct seed it. And, and two years later, I was rewarded with blooms last year. 
and it is, it is an awesome plant. Baptisia and Amsonia. Some, uh, this is a staghorn sumac mixed with uh, cone flowers. Okay, we're moving into summer. We're moving along here. So here's that beautiful Culver's root that I told you I felt was underutilized, mixed with the coneflower and the bee balm and the uh, blazing star, beautiful combination. So this is early summer, late spring, early summer. And I love also the yellow passion flower, Passiflora lutea, that blooms about the size of a quarter. And that is a Katie did wasp uh, foraging on it. And again, our beautiful, uh, be purple passion flower with the obedient plant. And there's the yellow again with the obedient plant, You're seeing the size of the bloom there. Um, more rattlesnake master. I, I, I have a thing for spiders, a good thing. In other words, I'm obsessed with them. <laughs> so I know where all my spiders are. Uh, green link spiders stake out a territory and they stick with it. They'll, they'll stick to a cone flower. So I'll go check on them and visit them every time I go to the garden. And it, as something I observed last year for the first time, well, by the way, I also love robber flies, another fierce predator, an aerial predator. And last year for the first time, I, I learned who came out on top when uh, faced with a matchup between a green link spider and a robber fly. So robber flies are aerial predators. They catch their prey in the air. They land on plants to survey their domain, to see who's flying. And they don't see the green leaf spiders when they're very well camouflaged on a green leaf. And um, three or four separate occasions, I snapped photos of the green leaf spiders feeding on the robber flies. So, oh, well, everybody's got to eat. <laughs> um, more cone flowers and liatris. See the blazing star, you see why I like that. Um, monarchs on the blazing star. Um, this is pretty much what you'd see now. Uh, the Culver's root, this could have taken this picture today. And you see lots of the, how popular the Joe Pau weed is here with all kinds of butterflies and other critters. Oh, and here's one of my, my crush plants. This is the uh, spurred butterfly pea vine, Centrosema virginiana. It is a native, very short vine. Uh, it blooms in the morning, it's incredible. It's a, a upside down flower, looks like an orchid. Um, and the bees love it. The bumblebees just push on in there. It's just gorgeous. I planted it as a ground cover and I've also discovered that it's deer resistant. So uh, I planted it all over areas that get a lot of deer pressure and they kind of, it kind of rambles over the other plants. Here are some tiger swallowtails enjoying the uh, seashore mallow. I'm right now monitoring all the spice bush swallowtail caterpillars in the garden. So I planted the spice bush, Lindira, to attract this butterfly to have these caterpillars. And they're growing. Uh, I've been posting pictures all over my Facebook page. This is a late instar, beautiful uh, butterfly caterpillar. The Agasaki Blue Fortune is real popular with uh, all summer with all the different types of pollinators. This is a sunflower bee on the um, orange cone flower, Rebecca. You can see I have a thing for Rattlesnake Master. <laughs> uh, here's a hummingbird on uh, foraging on um, uh, obedient plant. Another summer shot. I love wasp as well. This is one of our social wasps, of course, the paper wasp. This is a, 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 new, a juvenile or nymph of an ambush bug predator uh, hanging out on ironweed. Um, some of our flocks, uh, a hair streak on the stemless ironweed. Are we doing okay with a lag, Chris? Am I sort of keeping up? Yeah, this looks great. These are amazing. I can't tell when I'm saying, I can see it. I don't know if y'all are seeing the same thing. I don't want to mismatch. Okay, so now we're moving into the fall. We're going to finish up with the fall because my timer just went off. So that means I'm running out of time. I want to leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, You're doing great. Now you'll see why I love the native grasses. So this is some of our split beard blue stem mixed in with a salvia. Here's some uh, muley grass. Oh, it's just stunning, I think, the grasses in the fall, especially. Uh, here's a, a long-tailed skipper on, um, it's a beautiful uh, skipper on a uh, climbing aster vine. Some more of the uh, goldenrod and, and horse mint. 
Oh, we just saw that one. Sorry, that's a repeat. <laughs> so here's that beautiful golden color of the blue star. So, um, so this is a case where I purposely planted that purple aster in front of it because I knew it would look really good in the fall, you know, that fall color of the blue star. I, I did not enhance the color of that photo, I promise you. That's how golden yellow it is. Here's some um, uh, Rebecca with the blanket flower and another goldenrod. This is a really cool fall blooming gold, uh, lit liatris, which is unusual. This is liatris squerulosa with a uh, Maryland golden aster. Nice combo. Some more beautiful grasses with a Georgia aster. Uh, this is a stiff leaf aster with blanket flower. There's asters and goldenrod. Uh, one of our uh, flower flies on the American clasping aster. This is a really neat uh, white goldenrod. Unfortunately, it's hard to find right now. I planted it years ago and then I can't find it anymore. And it got choked out of the garden. Like it got overtaken or outcompeted. So I'd like to find more Solidago bicolor. Some um, Coreopsis with a smooth uh, aster. The beautiful great black wasp on uh, Eastern horse mint. Uh, that's a coral honeysuckle with a climbing aster. Okay, so now I've got two more slides. So I just want to point out um, the resources that you'll find on my website, and that is the URL there. So uh, lots of things on there. So during COVID, so as I mentioned earlier, I use the garden to teach workshops and I do tours. Well, during COVID, I couldn't do in-person programming, so I started creating a virtual garden tour video. So those have been really fun. So you can sit at home and uh, watch the video. I do one every month and I'm, you know, kind of showing you the highlights of plants and pollinators for that month. Um, so I'm continuing to do them this year. There's always a little lag, like I'm just putting together the May one because I know it's the end of June, I get it. <laughs> been kind of busy, but, um, but it'll get up there. And, and then of course, so, so look for those. And then I've got all the plant, a list of um, all the plants in the garden. I've got my top 25 list, which on the back of that has native plant nurseries and a link to find more native plant nurseries. I think one of the most valuable things on the website besides the videos is the what's in bloom list. So every two weeks I go around and document what's blooming that week. And it's archived back like 11 years now. So if you want to know what can I plant that'll bloom in May or August or October, you just look it up there. And that helps you identify also what's in the garden because I don't have all the plants labeled. It's not a botanical garden where everything's got a little sign. I don't have enough labor for that. And there are other reasons I don't do that as well. Um, but there's just uh, also I'm doing uh, I've resumed my in person tours. Uh, you do have to pre register and they when I announce them they live they generally fill up within a week like I just posted eight tours for the summer. There's a few slots left for August. Um, the spring, you know, so just if you want to, you can get on my email list and that way you'll get the announcement or follow me on Facebook or whatever. Um, and you'll get the announcement and sign up i'll be posting the fall tour soon and. Um, but, but speaking of that, if for those of you who are on social media, I post several times a week, you know, in the busy season, pictures from the garden that are educational. So I have entire photo albums devoted to the garden on my Facebook page. Like I originally started with one big one. So several years, like I had over a thousand photos. But the cool thing about it is all the plants and insects are identified. So it's a great learning tool, I think, for people. If you want to know what is that plant or when does it bloom or what is that butterfly, you can just look through my Facebook albums. You don't need, I don't think you even have to friend me. I think you can just look. So, so that would be, you know, for those of y'all, um, just find me on Facebook. It's debbie.roost.nc um, and look that up and you'll see lots of stuff on there. So that's, that's the end of that. So um, you want me to stop sharing, Chris, right? I don't need to. Um, yeah. Yeah, you can you can take the screen share. This, if it's okay, can I really like take two minutes to show them the website? Yeah, absolutely. Let me share again, and then gotta wait and pull it up.
Because when you brought it up, I was I went over and started looking at it and uh, tried to find a tour to sign up for real quick. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and I was thinking like, we should show this to people. This is this looks great. So let me try to, so here is, the, so I just got to find it when I click share. Um, that's the hard part because it's, hold on one second, bear with me all. Let's see, email is I'm trying to. And I'll remind everybody, uh, start dropping questions into the chat about the plants, the bugs, uh, whatever is popping into your minds right now about native plants and plant gardening, yeah. let us know for the Q&A. So Chris, can you see the website here? Uh, it hasn't popped up for me yet. Okay, hopefully soon. So this is my, once we, y'all can see it, this is my bigger growing small farm website. I do this website. It's about 500 plus pages. It's for small farmers and gardeners. So the pollinator garden website is a subset of it. Are you still not seeing it? Oh, you got it. Okay, good. Uh, so yeah, here good. it is. The very top link is for my tours. And like I said, they're almost all full, but I'll be posting more for the summer, a fall. I do private tours for groups of 10 or more. So keep that in mind. That's just that you're not going to see that on the schedule. Um, let me just give you an example of uh, the what's in bloom. So I'll I'll show you just what that looks like and then I'll stop sharing and answer questions. Um, well, yeah, it may take a while to come up. So if y'all want to, if you want to start asking questions, Chris, I'm fine to go with that. Okay, that's great. Uh, let's see. The first one that I see here is about Baptisias. Valerie wants to know, is one color of Baptisia more native than the others because they've seen yellow in the wild as well? Yeah, so as I, as I mentioned in the slide, there are several different native species and depending on the species uh, determines the color. So there's a yellow native species, there's a blue native species, there's a white native species. And then when you get into the cultivars, that's pretty much any color you want. Mm. So just keep in mind, there are multiple native species for North Carolina, multiple. I don't know how many off the top of my head. So there's, yeah, so you'll see of the native ones, I know of white, purple, blue, and yellow. And there's infinite colors when you start getting into cultivars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And, you know, you had mentioned earlier too I don't think about. It's going to work. Okay, y'all can look. You had mentioned earlier too uh, about the, the differences between like the straight species and then getting into the cultivars. And I know that in, in my pollinator garden journey, uh, I've come across just, it seems like unlimited cultivars of some of these things, especially uh, recently with like um, coneflowers. There's pretty much every color and every flower petal shape and they come in gradients of color. So I am curious how you feel about or what you think about a lot of these cultivars as native plants have become more popular, there seem to be more cultivars showing up in garden centers and nurseries. Yeah, a lot of people call them native bars. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I, as a plant uh, nut, it's hard for me to resist a lot of those. So I just, not knowing of their value to pollinators, I make sure I also have the straight species. Now, there are a couple of blanket statements you can say about cultivars when they're definitely not helpful to pollinators. For example, when you see cultivars that have double blooms, you know, where you, the pollinator can't even access the pollen, pollen and nectar, that's not going to be helpful to pollinators. Does that mean you shouldn't have it in your garden? No. It just means you recognize that that's not going to provide a, a resources for pollinators. Make sure you have others that do. I work with cut flower growers and a lot of them grow many different, well, they grow many different species of flowers. They grow many different cultivars of sunflower. Often they're selecting a pollenless sunflower. Why? Because the people who buy their bouquets don't want them shedding pollen on their white tablecloth. So that so that's not offering resources for bees either. Bees want pollen. 
But um, again, just make sure you have a mixture of both because we don't know unless research has specifically been done on that top that cultivar, we can't tell you if it's more or less attractive to pollinators. Because research has shown that some cultivars are more attractive. <laughs> so just hedge your bets is what I would say. That sounds good. Yeah, I, I just recently this this past spring got some of that uh, peaches pick. Mm-hmm. Uh, of the Stokes Aster and yeah, it's in full bloom right now and it's gorgeous and the critters seem to love it. Yeah. Yeah, just through observation, you can often tell, you know, how attractive it is, yeah. And I think I actually, we'll see if this works from my end. Can you see your website? Yes. I was trying to show so this, this is the but it was being unresponsive it said so so if i if i'm on your website and i say go to june 14th here there you go let's just show them an example of what they're going to see when they click on that so usually i'll show a few snapshots from that time period that two week period and then if you scroll down you'll see the what's in bloom list Here we go. Yep. So it's going to identify all the plants that are blooming that week. And most of them are linked. Like if you click on that where it says Agastache Rupestris, it's going to take you to the NCSU plant database, which is a really valuable resource. This is incredible. Yeah. This is an amazing resource. So if, 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 if it's not native to North Carolina, well, if it is, like for Allium cernuum, I don't put anything. If it's not native to our state, I put where it's native, I put a little asterisk and I tell you where it's native or if it's exotic, not native to the US at all. This is amazing. Yeah, thanks. And I'm gonna, I hope everybody should go take advantage of that. Yeah. All right, let's see here. Okay, more questions for you. Uh, do you have any tips on how to plant which plant where other than trial and error? Well, okay. So there's different, there's different things to consider there. One is um, culturally, what does the plant need? Does it want shade, sun, wet, dry, that kind of thing. And then the other consideration is aesthetics, like combining plants with other plants. And, and I teach a whole, that's design. So I teach a workshops on that. I can't give a, a 30 second answer to that, but you're considering what, what you're trying to do with uh, combining plants is you want to, the, the main thing you need to know is when you're combining colors and textures, you need to have knowledge of what blooms at the same time as that plant. So for example, most of us recognize that orange and blue look good together. That's a good color combo or whatever. So, so that's why things like uh, Blazing Star, which is purple or blue, or it's purple, and uh, Butterfly Weed, which is orange, look great together. But you wouldn't, however, want to, so, so, okay, the same strategy, orange, butterfly, weed, blue aster, right? Well, what's the problem there? Blue aster blooms in the fall and butterfly weed blooms in the spring. So they're never going to sync up and bloom and you know, so you have to have knowledge of when things bloom at the same time to know how to combine them. So, um, you know, I'm more, I've developed lists uh, of combinations of plants. And when you take my longer, um, you know, when you take my longer workshops, we go into all that. So eventually I'm hoping to put all those resources on my website. It's just a matter of the time to get them up there. <laughs> but that's what you consider. You consider bloom color, you know, texture, environmental factors, you know, like, do they have the same needs for moisture and sunlight and all of that? Yeah. And size and height also, of course, goes in there. You're not going to put generally, you know, it's usually from short to tall from the beginning to the back of the bed, unless you have a seedling plant. Are there any plants uh, that you feel like folks should not put in their gardens? Anything? Like, uh, like I've heard other native plant guests talk about, uh, like tropical milkweeds. 
And they say, yeah. so, avoid those. Right. So, so first of all, first and foremost, avoid any invasive plants. So do your research. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I work with beekeepers and I, I've heard some beekeepers say, they'll argue uh, because, you know, some of these invasive plants are really attracted to honeybees, especially in the off season, like winter or whatever. And, you know, you can argue with it. Oh, no, no, it's not invasive. I, I don't see any problem with it on my, it's not, I'm, it's not spreading. Well, the problem is you can't see it spreading because the birds are carrying the seed off of your property, right? So I don't care how attractive a plant is to pollinators. If it's invasive, please don't plant it because that's causing a lot of problems in our natural areas. Um, tropical milkweed, that's somewhat controversial. The idea there is, uh, especially in warmer areas where they're not killed back by, um, you know, uh, winter frost, they will uh, delay the migration of monarchs and whatnot. That's not typically a problem here, but this is the way I look at that. Mm. Um, we've got so many great native milkweed to choose from. Why would I need to pick a tropical one? <laughs> so like I told you, I've got 10 native milkweed species in my garden. So I just would rather choose a native when I can than, than any potential problems that may come from a tropical uh, milkweed. Yeah. But those are the Excellent. main things, Thank you. you know, other than just recognizing certain plants are extremely spready, aggressive, and may take time to manage. So you just have to be, and whenever I'm giving a tour, talking about a plant, I always tell people which plants those are, and they have to decide if they want to put it in their garden. I'm talking about natives here. So some of the natives will spread more than you may want to deal with. And, you know, depending on how much time, you, you know, what kind of area you have. If you have a natural area or a slope that you want to prevent erosion, that would be a great choice for that. But, you know, it just depends on your situation. Excellent advice. Yeah, my cut leaf coneflower is currently taking over. So. Cut leaf coneflower, which one is that? So there's a common name. I'm not sure which plant you're referring to. Oh, you know what? I'd have to go. Uh -huh. I'd have to research it yeah. to get the scientific name. Yeah. Right. Oh gosh, I got a guy mowing behind me. Good thing we're finishing up here. <laughs> I don't know if y'all can hear me. <laughs> yeah, I hear it. Well, I, and I'm looking at the clock and uh, everybody in the chat is saying that this has been a fabulous presentation. They're excited to check out the resources that you've got. So Debbie, thanks for sharing all of your knowledge and information and expertise with us today on the program. I was happy to do it. I appreciate, I don't know who's out there, <laughs> but uh, I appreciate y'all uh, listening and, and Please come visit the garden. If you go to the website, I've got the address on there. It's completely open to the public 24 uh, seven. Sign up for a tour, watch the videos. And I hope, I, I hope I'll see y'all at the garden. I think it's on everybody's list. <laughs> and folks, uh, I put the link also over in the chat to make it easy for you to get to. Uh, and I'll add it to the video description down below. So if you come back to this video, to check out these resources, see the, the top 25. You'll also have the links readily available to you right here at the museum's YouTube channel. So Debbie, thanks so much once again for sharing with us. Everybody, thanks for tuning in today to this program. Next week on the show is the LGBTQ plus leaders in STEM panel discussion. I'll be chatting with five different guests about their experiences as people working in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and who identify within the LGBTQ plus community. So it's going to be a great conversation. I hope that you'll be there for that one again. That's next Wednesday at noon for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Until next time, everybody, take care, stay safe. We'll see you again soon. Bye, folks.